Hey, my name is Matt Storr, and I repair saxophones for a living, and today I'd like to talk to you about what I think is one of the more underrated saxophones out there, the Con 6M, specifically uh, pre-war. And the reason I say that is that during the war, production got shut down. Con actually made, oh, you know what? I've got one. Con actually made altimeters during the war. All the machinery and stuff that was needed to make the saxophones was actually put outside under tarps and um, the skilled labor that remained that was not drafted or volunteered for the war effort was um, diverted to make altimeters and things just changed right i mean imagine shutting down a giant factory and doing something completely different for four to five years and then coming back to it um, things are going to change also the market had changed underneath con and uh, the quality of the Wartime horns, of which there's only a few because there was actually a government prohibition upon making them. Um, so you had to have like a special dispensation to make a saxophone during that time. I think most of those actually came from bodies and keys that were already finished prior to the war. Um, the wartime horns and the post-war horns were just not as good. And by about 1948 or so, um, they actually lost one of the main features, which is the rolled tone holes. And by the mid-50s, it had become more of an intermediate horn, although the post-war horns can represent a really good value. But most of what I'm talking about, when you hear the excitement in my voice, when I say superlative things about it, I'm talking about the quality and craftsmanship of the pre-war horns, of which this is one. So the Con 6M was made in various flavors from like 1932 until like through the 60s. Um, but the ones we're talking about today are probably from... 33 until you know 1941 when the war started um the early ones were called transitionals they had a couple different features i've got a very long article on my website about them actually and um i used to have a video on con transitionals but there was this weird um thing with youtube that uh you could accidentally completely permanently delete a video uh, from the mobile app with one touch if you were trying to add or remove them from a playlist. That bug, short, uh, thankfully, was short-lived, but um, one of my videos was a uh, casualty of that, so it is gone forever unless someone saved it somewhere, in which case, give it to me. I'll re-upload it. But probably a lot of things I, I said in there are going to be uh, said here, and also, really, with the exception of the very early transitionals that are basically New Wonder Series 2 horns, with the addition of a sculpted uh, E key. Most of the transitionals are actually more like a 6M. They'll have um, maybe a different left-hand pinky table, um, but most of them, especially from around serial number 250,000 onwards, are very, very much like this. And as it, you know, as it happens, around serial number 250,000 is my personal favorite. So the Con 6M is an is a alto saxophone made by the CG Con Company in the United States um, in Elkhart, Indiana. And you see them a lot of times in lacquer. Sometimes in the earlier 30s, you see them in silver an awful lot. Every once in a great while, uh, there's gold plate. I've seen a couple of those. I think there's maybe a dozen that exist. I'm not totally sure. And they've got a lot of interesting features that, you know, I kind of tend to think that if there was a, you know, parallel universe, this might have become the standard for saxophones going forward instead of the Mark VI. This saxophone was designed um, in a different way than usual, uh, at least for the time. Kahn established what they called the experimental laboratory, and they applied the scientific method to saxophone design, and some really, really smart people uh, were employed there, some really, really amazing saxophone designers, and a lot of money was put into it. A lot of the, you know, sort of profits of the 1920s saxophone craze were plowed back into uh, making a better saxophone, and make a better saxophone they did. It's kind of weird when you pick one of these up that actually plays the way it's supposed to play, which is relatively rare, which is why I think they're um, undervalued. It is just so fast, so fast, so smooth. The intonation is so good. The tone is really powerful, centered, punchy, resonant, and rich. But it's hardly ever like that when you buy one these days. And the main reason is this double socket neck. Um, 
there's, as you'll see, the inside, like the inset part is fairly short. The actual bearing surface of, you know, the air tightness of the neck is only, see that shiny bit? It's because I fit this neck. It's only that part of it. And most of the time, they didn't seal too well from the factory. It's just kind of hard to do. It's a weird design. Um, it's a neat idea, but in practice, if this joint is not completely airtight, and you can't do anything about it from tightening this down because it's not the outside that does the uh, leak sealing usually. It is actually the inside tenon against the inside of the body tenon. And the outside is merely for mechanical fit, for mechanical tightness. You tighten this down, it stops moving, but it doesn't have anything to do, uh, or usually doesn't have anything to do with the air tightness. Also, the micro tuner can be finicky and also can be not airtight and needs to be. When I overhaul these horns, I usually sort of separate the neck out as like its separate own overhaul. I overhaul the micro tuner. There's going to be a bunch of videos in the description about how I do that and about what to look for. And I also um, fit the neck. And that's usually the first thing I do, because if I don't, I'm left with a really, you know, a horn that is ready to go, except for a huge job that's usually a pain in the butt of getting the neck right. But once the neck is right on these, these are some of the best horns ever made, bar none. The construction is some of the best ever, bar none. And as far as how the horn plays, they're just really, really great. Now they're undervalued because most people have only played them with neck leaks as well as, you know, bad overhauls or mechanical issues, or they're just not in good shape. But almost all of them have a neck leak and they just don't play right. They're stuffy, um, they're dead, they're backed up. It just doesn't feel good. But once you get that taken care of, which is a, you know, big caveat because it's hard to do. These are really, really good horns. They're built probably among the best of any saxophone ever built. Con craftsmanship in the 30s was just second to none. Um, one of the things they did that I actually really like that a lot of people don't is the set screws. And I've got videos on that. A lot of times these little tiny set screws that are in control of infinitely adjustable pivot screws, right? So saxophone keys can be held on in two main ways. One is through, you know, two pivot screws at either end and a solid rod, and the pivot screws hold it in place and it rotates on that. Or there can be a long hinge rod, which goes like along like a stack of keys, like we're seeing here, like on the lower stack, right? Um, these make it possible, the set screws with infinitely adjustable pivot screws make it possible to, you know, make sure you've got a perfect key fit on your pivot screws every single time. The only issue is these tiny little screws over time can get, um, you know, rusted and locked in place and they are difficult to get out. And a lot of times instead of getting them out, people will just like, you know, I don't know, do things that are less awesome than the correct thing. And these can end up just getting worse and worse and worse. So if you want to find one of these, find one in good original condition or that someone has, you know, overhauled well and pay attention to these little set screws look for all of them being there. If they're all there, if they all look good, if like, you know, you can see the heads of it there, if they're not totally chewed up, um, if they're, you know, seem to be in pretty good condition, where's the G? There it is. Um, then that'll tell you a lot about, you know, who's worked on the horn, how. And there's quite a bit of those. You can get these screws replacement new from Faris Tools, and they're the correct size and shape and everything. The, let's see, what are these? These are, I believe they are 164. Um, there's a place that sells the wrong size. It's close enough that it sometimes fits, but it does cross thread. Um, but I believe these are 164. I will double check that. And I know that I've got it correct in my video about these set screws, which I'll link to below. Another thing that can sometimes be wrong with these, and let's see, do I have it? The rollers um, are made of like a cellulose type material. So these are a bunch of originals here. Um, and they tend to kind of like rot or die over time. Sometimes people burn them by accident um, and you just kind of can't bring them back. Or more commonly, the screws underneath rust and push them apart and they just crack and crumble. Um, you can make new rollers with this stuff. And... This is a, you know, very, very cheap, pretty easy to make, and they end up looking right. These are actually replacement rollers I made to replace originals that were cracked. And the color is pretty darn close to what the originals, and these are aged a little bit, so they kind of get yellowish over time. 
but they're pretty darn close to what the originals looked like. I'm trying to get this like close without hitting my camera mount. Um, so a really, really great design that plays really, really well, kind of ahead of its time. It had a separated bis and a separated G. So this is one of the first horns Khan made. I say one of the first because they actually, a lot of these designs came around in the F mezzo first, but one of the first horns that was made and one of the first cons made with sort of a modern setup where the G and the bis are on pivot screws. And then the upper stack is just the A, the B and the C sharp. Um, this one actually also has the side key on that, like the side B flat, um, which is un unusual, but it works out okay. Um, and then the lower stack, the G sharp is on a separate rod, which is nice. And then your lower stack is just the normal stuff we see today of the F sharp, F, E, and D. Um, and you can see that this no longer has the alternate E flat. Some of the earliest ones, you can actually see like that they punched a tone hole and then soldered it shut. So it's kind of like they just deleted that key, um, which is fine. It still does have the G sharp trill set up in a different way from the earlier ones where it used to be on the earlier uh, cons, you would actually hold down the G sharp and then press this. It was like reversed. So this was actually physically attached to the G sharp as one unit. And when you press the G sharp, you press this down to close it. And that's how it trilled. On this one, it's a one finger trill. You don't need to press the G sharp. This actually actuates it from underneath. Um, let's see, the rolled tone holes, uh, there's a, you know, people have different opinions on like, you know, how much that matters, like what it actually does. Let's see, you can see them a little easier here. Um, I like them. They can be unlevel sometimes. And there are people that will kind of like, you know, push, like if the tone hole's unlevel, they'll actually like push it up from underneath. Or if it's high on one side, they'll push it down. If the body is undamaged, that is going to, in my opinion, you know, it's it, well not an opinion it is definitely going to change the internal volume underneath there right i mean like imagine if this tone hole if i wanted to lift that up a bit and i pressed from underneath it's not just going to lift the tone hole right like that metal has to stretch so there's going to be like an area of increased volume that extends like maybe a quarter inch away um and then the area right underneath this tone hole is going to have an increased volume that does affect intonation um i mean with clarinets and stuff, they undercut tone holes on purpose you know, to change the volume underneath a tone hole to change the intonation. And that will happen on the saxophone too. So, you know, leveling tone holes on an otherwise good condition body is something that I will try to avoid at all costs, unless I just absolutely cannot make a pad seat on a tone hole. But that means that you're looking at a, you know, what I would say at that point is a manufacturing defect, which is pretty uncommon with these these rolled tone holes are actually usually really flat. Now the original pads they would have had you use with this are the Con Mezzo pads. I've actually got some sitting right here, some of the originals. And these were kind of interesting. These don't have the resonator in the middle, but there's actually a rim, like a metal rim around the outside that stretches the skin tight. And this sits like the edge of the tone hole here. This little metal rim sits on the outside of the tone hole, right? And one of the things that this does, is it gives you a lot more like operating clearance as far as like seating a tone hole, seating a pad with a tone hole is really close to the edge. So on a few t tone holes, like this low D here, you might be able to see like it's pretty close to the edge, right? And that can be tricky for some people. Um, it can be tricky if you're new to pad work. And there's a few tone holes like that where the tone hole is pretty large in comparison to the key cup. But if you've got decent quality pads that are, you know, pretty flat all the way out to the edge, let's see, I'll take it out. Like here's the pads I use. You can see like they're pretty flat all the way out to the edge just as they start. And it's got a nice like, you know, sharp angle at the end. Sometimes pads that are not great quality can be pretty rounded on the ends um, and they won't be flat and they'll be lumpy and that can make your job hard. So good quality pads are gonna be a must. You can use the Rezo pads if you want. I think it's Freeze that still makes them these days. Um, not something that I've done a whole lot. I don't find it super necessary. Um, I get good results with the pads I like and I'm more familiar with them, so that's what I stick with. Um, let's see, what else? Um, 
Oh yeah, it's got a, you know, different left-hand pinky table than Selmer. So if you are the kind of person that is doomed to only be able to play or feel comfortable on the Selmer style uh, left-hand pinky table, then this is not something you would like. But this does feel pretty good. The G-Sharp goes straight up and down. It's got like this long arm underneath here. It's actually a pretty cool design that they went, they actually made all of the keys do that on the 26M, which I've got a video about where they go straight up and down instead of like, you know, rotating along an arc. Um, and this works pretty well. The only issue is it's got a relatively short rod here that this really long piece of the G-Sharp is actuated on. So if it's not tight, this will like wobble back and forth. Now you can see like this one isn't doing and I'm moving the horn. So fitting that key is pretty necessary if it doesn't come out like, you know, if it doesn't start off absolutely perfect. Um, also, there's a number of like sliding linkages. Like here you'll see, you know, the, the B is pushing down on the B, or sorry, the B flat is pushing down on the B, which is then rubbing against the G sharp to give you that like um, articulated G sharp or automatic G sharp. Putting a little bit of Teflon in those places, like also against the bis there and where the G sharp spatula activates the G sharp key is a really good idea and makes the horn feel a lot more positive. Also, like with a lot of cons, sometimes the key feet are really small um, and making it so that, you know, they contact the body all at once is going to be um, really important if you don't want things to feel spongy. They can actually sort of like jam the adjustment materials under there and get the key like sort of stuck open and it requires like extra energy to um, start the key travel, which doesn't feel very good. But yeah, that is the Con 6M. I really, really like them. I actually, you know, when I find a clean example, if I can afford it, I pick it up and I'll overhaul it and sell it to somebody eventually. Um, they only made, I mean, if you're talking about the pre-war ones, the serial numbers go from 250,000-ish to like 310,000-ish. And, you know, that's all of the saxophones. They made the M series in, you know, a few sopranos, a lot of altos, a decent amount of tenors, some baritones, very few basses. But probably out of that, you know, 60,000 horns, probably half of those maybe are altos. So you're talking about you got 25 to 30,000 of these things originally made, right? A ton of them got used, a lot of them are gone. Um, and meanwhile, the Mark VI, there's like 150,000 of those horns made, 75,000 of which are altos. So the relative rarity of other horns, I don't think people really like fully understand a lot of the time, that there's just not many of these out there. And, but you can still come across really clean ones like this. Um, and I think they're probably undervalued now. They'll probably go up, especially if people can figure out how to, you know, deal with getting these neck tenons uh, fit correctly. One thing I've thought of is like a little like gasket up in there. I've actually seen that once or twice. Like someone took like a piece of cork and like put it way up there, like as a gasket that seals against the top here, but it just doesn't work too well. Um, oh, also sometimes you'll see them with this stamp on it, the eight stamp. This one has it on the neck and the body. They tend to be more desirable, although the reasons for why tend to vary. Um, I'm not certain that I notice a huge difference, but hey, if I get one, yeah, cool. But I don't think I really notice a huge difference. Um, oh, also the way that the like key heights, so you've got these key cages that are soldered to the body, and then you've got a piece of felt that gets kind of like clamped in between these two like leaves of brass. Let's see, it also is on like the B flat and B. Now, I usually, what I'll do for those is I take a, I take a felt bumper and I cut it to width and then I cut it, you know, to where it's like a half moon or whatever I want. And then I put shellac on one side and I heat it, I, I, you know, heat this piece and then put it in there and then clamp it shut. If you just use like the physical force of clamping this stuff shut, it will move. Um, and also, you know, you don't want to like really get it too far past, like, as you can see there, right? Like that is like parallel. Um, these little brass tabs, if you overdo it, you know, you'll eventually break it. Um, but you can see, you know, like that key cup is fairly close to like those metal pieces. You got to be careful about that. And the height of this low C, 
This is one of the things I don't like about the design. You can see like this post is so close that the back end of the C is pretty close. So it's the front end where most of the tone space is. So it has to be pretty far open. And having that be, you know, close to as open as you can get it is what's going to define the key heights for the rest of the horn, which you'll see are typically moderate. This was designed for speed and it really feels like it. The key heights are not supposed to be crazy open. They don't need to be crazy open. Um, you know, that left hand pinky table is supposed to be flat and intonation on a moderate mouthpiece. If you've got something extreme, it's really long that has like a you know, tiny chamber is probably going to be kind of difficult. Um, now the micro tuner does give you, and I've got a video about a video about this, does give you a lot of sort of extra leeway, right? Usually when you put a mouthpiece on, let's see, do I have it sitting here? Yeah. Right, usually when you put a mouthpiece on, right? If you're pulling it out, you're not just lengthening the instrument. The inside of the mouthpiece is bigger than the inside of the neck, right? So you're actually also adding volume, right? And the reverse is true. When you push a mouthpiece in, you're not just shortening it, you're also reducing the volume, right? And think about like, you know, the distance to your first open tone hole is like where a horn tunes, right? Like that's what cause, that's what your intonation is. If I push this in a quarter inch, the overall amount of change that makes when we're talking about like my, you know, palm D or something that's this far away versus my low D, which is like this far away, it's a much bigger difference for the top of the horn than it is for the bottom of the horn, right? Um, the micro tuner allows you to decouple those things because you can put your mouthpiece all the way on and then screw this in or out to change the length alone and not the volume. Or you can, you know, pull your mouthpiece out a little bit and then put the micro tuner in a little bit and you change the volume without the length. So it gives you something to play with that I think is pretty valuable. A lot of people overlook that because they don't realize that, you're, that you've got two different relationships going on and this decouples them and allows you to play with one and not the other. Um, but that's a really cool um, feature of the 6M, I think, is the micro tuner when they're in proper operating condition. I mean, as you can see, it should be quiet. It should be easy to turn, right? Not difficult at all, but it should stay in place and it shouldn't go click, 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 click. Right, it's probably hard to hear because of the rain right now, but this is quiet. Um, also, when you're doing these, I typically do the neck cork with a micro tuner apart because the dust from when you're sanding the neck cork will get down inside this part here. And it doesn't actually affect the mechanism because there's like a shield between like the actual screw mechanism and the front, but it does like make there be like some gumminess, like gummy, like, you know, grease mixed with uh, cork dust in there that I don't like. So um, when you're doing a neck cork, just take that part off. It's not a big deal. So that is the Con 6M, the horn I really, really like. Um, I find to be undervalued with one major caveat that the neck, getting the neck to not leak is both essential and relatively difficult. But once you do that, if you get everything else right on this horn, if you know the overhaul is good, it will hold its own against anything and honestly beat a lot of other stuff. And you can typically pick these up for not a ton right now. Just the key is getting a good overhaul. Um, yeah. So hopefully that was helpful, useful, informative. I'm sure I missed some stuff. In the description, there's going to be some links to, you know, various subtopics. And also Stephen Howard um, in the UK has a really good write-up of these. Um, and I'm sure he says some stuff that I missed. But um, yeah, that's about it for today. Hopefully you found that helpful, useful, and informative. My name is Matt Storr. I repair saxophones for a living. Thanks for watching.